Hey guys, today we are continuing on in our biochemistry unit, the chemistry of life. Um, we are studying macromolecules today, so please make sure you are filling out your notes organizer as you are watching this video. Stop, pause, rewatch as many times as you need to in order to make sure you answer every question. So let's just start with a quick review of some vocab terms that I'm going to use a lot in this video lecture. Remember, atoms are the building blocks of matter. They're made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Elements are those pure substances that cannot be broken down, made up of one type of atom. So we have sodium is an element, chloride is an element, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, that sort of thing. When we bond those elements together, when we bond those atoms together, um, we call them a molecule. So two or more atoms join together with a chemical bond. Today, we are gonna be discussing what we call the biological macromolecules. For each of our four macromolecules, we will discuss the building blocks that, would, that make up that macromolecule, the function of the macromolecule in a living organism, some examples of where we will find that type of biological macromolecule, and then just some additional information for each type of macromolecule. Okay, so you're gonna hear me say this phrase biological macromolecule again and again and again, but we can't talk about my macromolecules without understanding a little bit about carbon, which is what we find in all of the macromolecules. So carbon atoms are the basis of most molecules that make up living organisms. In fact, you are about 18% carbon. 18% of your body is just the element carbon, which is pretty crazy to think about. So carbon molecules form the structures of living things, and they really are the molecules that are carrying out most of the metabolic processes that are keeping living things alive. Why? Why carbon? What is so unique about carbon that makes it such an important thing to living organisms? Well, it has a pretty unique atomic structure. Uh, the outside shell, the outside electron shell or energy level of a carbon atom has four electrons, which means that it can form four covalent bonds with up to four other atoms, including another atom of carbon. So those four covalent bonds are really stable bonds, which is one thing that makes carbon really useful. Um, it bonds really well with oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, and phosphorus, which those are important parts of living organisms. If you go back and look at that slide before, you are mostly those elements. So the fact that carbon can bond really well with those things and also with other carbon atoms is really unique to that type of, of atom. Uh, carbon atoms can form single, double, and triple bonds. So the fact that it can fill all four spaces and that can be with a single bond, a double bond, or a triple bond makes carbon really useful for living organisms. All living things are largely made up of four biological macromolecules. Okay, we're gonna talk about carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. So if I were to just summarize why that is, because these macromolecules serve as essential sources of energy, energy storage, the raw materials that we need for various processes, and the instructions for life. And we're gonna get into the details of each type of macromolecule. These biological macromolecules that we're gonna learn about today are examples of what we call organic molecules. Typically, we refer to organic as something containing carbon, but if we wanna get a technical definition, it's actually when carbon is bonded to hydrogen. So you will notice that in the four macromolecules that we're gonna learn about today, we always have carbon bonded to a bunch of different hydrogen atoms. Okay, so you can see organic versus inorganic. So even CO2, which has carbon, is technically an inorganic molecule because it's not carbon and hydrogen. Okay, macromolecule, the word literally means large molecule. So it is a molecule, meaning lots of bonds, that is very large. Um, most macromolecules can also be referred to as polymers. Uh, poly means many. So if a macromolecule is many of something, what is it many of? It's many monomers. A monomer, mono means one, is a single subunit that gets repeated over and over and over in order to make what we call a polymer. Most of your biological macromolecules are polymers. We're gonna get into the exception to the rule there in just a minute. So monomers are smaller repeating subunits that make up polymers. Monomers, in other words, are the building blocks of polymer, the unit that gets repeated over and over and over to make the polymer or the macromolecule. All right, so here are our four biological macromolecules, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. We're gonna give some details on each one of these. So starting with carbohydrates, and I would recommend that you sort of remember these in the order that I'm teaching you so that you can remember what elements they are made up of. Carbohydrates are composed of three elements. I want you to remember carbohydrates cho, carbon, 
hydrogen, and oxygen, and more specifically, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in this one to two to one ratio. So for every one carbon, there are two hydrogens and one oxygen. So think about glucose, which is a carbohydrate, is C6H12O6. That's a one to two to one ratio. Carbohydrates, or sugars, uh, are made up of building blocks known as monosaccharides. Saccharide means sugar. So a monosaccharide is a single sugar, or what we call a simple sugar. Glucose, for example, is a single monosaccharide. Fructose is another example of five-ringed sugar right here. So that's another example of a monosaccharide. You put monosaccharides together to make up complex carbohydrates, okay? Things that are made up of lots of sugars, polymers, if you will. So when you put two monosaccharides together, so for example, sucrose or lactose, those are called disaccharides. So two monosaccharides form a disaccharide. If you put a bunch of monosaccharides together, it becomes what we call a complex carb or a complex sugar or a polysaccharide because it has many monosaccharides. So starches, um, glycogen, cellulose, making up cell walls of plants. Those are all examples of complex carbohydrates. Why do we need carbohydrates? Why do living things all have carbohydrates in them? Well, carbohydrates are your body's main source of energy. Now, if they are simple sugars, they provide you with a certain type of energy. And if they're complex sugars, they provide you with a different type of energy. Simple sugars, like you would find in an apple, monosaccharides, disaccharides, are going to provide you with energy very quickly. Think about that. There's not much to break down, right? So you got to get the, the energy from the bonds. You don't have to break many bonds. So simple sugars provide you with energy very quickly. I would eat an apple right before I run a race. But complex carbohydrates starches, things like that, provide you with long lasting energy. So the night before a half marathon, you're gonna eat a bowl of pasta because pasta is full of starch. Um, so it, it's gonna take a while to break down those polysaccharides, those complex carbohydrates into simpler molecules to get the energy. So it's gonna be a while before you really start feeling the effects of the energy in a complex carb. Um, carbohydrates are also used for things like structure and support. Uh, for example, cellulose, which is the material making up like celery, for example, that's that stringy, tough material. That's a good structural material for plants. Uh, grains, pastas, fruits, vegetables, sugar, obviously, honey, potatoes. Those are all examples of materials that have lots of significant amounts of carbohydrates. Okay, now we're going to talk about lipids. When you hear lipids, I want you to think of fats. Um, lipids are composed also of CHO, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but the ratio is a little bit different. Uh, fats are mostly just chains of carbon and hydrogen, carbohydrate, carbon, hydrogen chains. There are really very little O's in a lipid. So the C and H are in a one to two ratio, but there's really only a few oxygen atoms in a molecule of a lipid. Lipids are what we call hydrophobic because they are nonpolar molecules. Water is polar, so polar and nonpolar, they don't like to mix. So hydrophobic means water-fearing. So fats are hydrophobic or water-fearing. They don't mix with water, which is going to make sense when we get into their different functions. Now, here's the thing. Lipids are sort of the exception to the rule. They do not have a true monomer. They don't have this subunit that gets repeated over and over and over, but they do sort of all have the same basic structure. All lipids have what we call a glycerol backbone, this, this part right here, and then attached to that, we have fatty acid chains. What you're looking at right here is what we call a triglyceride because it's three of those fatty acid chains attached to one glycerol backbone. That's a really common lipid. You might've actually heard that phrase before, triglyceride. Now, you've probably heard of saturated fats and unsaturated fats. Saturated fats, or what are typically solid fats, they are saturated with only single bonds. This is the kind of fat that you typically find in animal fats, like meat and butter. Those are saturated fats. Those really aren't healthy. You want to, you want to minimize the amount of saturated fats that you are eating. Unsaturated fats tend to be what we call healthy fats. They are called unsaturated because they have at least one double bond. So think about saturated fats are saturated with single bonds. That's all they have. But unsaturated fats have at least one double bond and typically more than that. These are like plant fats, such as olive oil and peanut oil. Again, typically healthier fats. 
And the thing about those double bonds is they make what are called kinks in the fatty acid chain, which makes it really hard for those molecules to pack tightly together. And if you can't pack tightly together, you can't form a solid. So you can see in this picture here, saturated fats versus unsaturated fats, and then what it looks like to form that kink at a double bond, and it shows you why they can't um, compact tightly together to form a solid. The function of lipids is to store energy. So carbohydrates are your main source of energy, but we can store energy in fats if we don't have the energy available in carbohydrates. That's the whole idea behind the keto diet. You're breaking down fat because you're, you're depriving yourself of carbohydrates. So some additional functions of lipids, not only are they storage, are they good storage for energy, but because they don't mix with water, it allows them to be really good for preventing water loss and creating barriers. The cell membrane, for example, is a phospholipid bilayer. The membranes of your cells literally are made of lipids to keep water in and out of the cell when it's supposed to be there. The waxy part on a leaf, that's that wax is a lipid, so it keeps water inside, lets water outside whenever it's supposed to be there. Honeycomb in a beehive, that's a good example of a lipid. Um, insulation, because Lipids don't mix with water. It makes it very good for, for insulating. So the fat of a walrus, the blubber of a walrus is full of lipids. And then here are some examples of other materials that have significant amounts of lipids. Some foods here, butter, olive oil, vegetable oil, peanut oil, avocado is very healthy fats, nuts, very healthy fat, cheese. And then if you've heard of steroids before, cholesterol, okay, those are all examples of lipids. Okay, now we're going to get into proteins, and proteins are the most diverse and abundant macromolecule that all living organisms have. So the most varied of the carbon-based molecules with a wide variety of functions in living things. So everything from you need proteins to contract the muscles in your body to you need proteins to transport oxygen in your blood. Spiders need structural proteins to create spider silk. Okay, that's all proteins. Proteins are composed of four elements. I want you to remember chan. So we've had cho, cho, now we have chan. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen make up proteins. About 15% of your body's total mass are actually proteins. That's how diverse and abundant they are. Your hair, your skin, your nails, those are all things that are made up of proteins. And if you remember from like life science in middle school, proteins are made by the ribosome. And then here comes this phrase again that we've said a million times already. The structure of a protein determines its function. So that's going to be really important when we talk about enzymes, which are a type of protein. Now, the building blocks of proteins are what are called amino acids. You add together amino acids in order to make a protein. There are 20 different types of amino acids. Your body, depending on how old you are, can make around somewhere between 10 and 12 of those 20 amino acids. The other 10-ish come from your diet. You that's why it's so important to make sure you're eating protein as part of a balanced diet. Those are called your essential amino acids, the amino acids that you can't make, but that you have to get from your food because you still need those amino acids to make the proteins that you need in your body. Amino acids, if, these, if this is an amino acid, these amino acids are held together by what we call peptide bonds. So sometimes you will hear a protein called a polypeptide chain telling you that the protein is made up of many peptide bonds holding those amino acids together. Now, it's hard to give a function to proteins because they really do so much in every organism. They're involved in nearly every function of all living things. So they're good for structural support. They're good for building muscle, right? You drink your protein shake in order to build muscle. They're good for communication between cells. They're needed for speeding up chemical reactions, right? We've talked about enzymes. Those are special types of proteins. They're good for controlling cell growth. All of these things require proteins. And then here are some examples of good sources of proteins, meats, eggs, nuts, beans, fish, cheese, milk, and then hemoglobin and insulin, which you've probably heard of, are proteins in the body need needed for different things. If you've ever heard um, eggs, for example, called a complete protein food source, what that is telling you is that eggs actually contain all of the essential amino acids that cannot be made by your body. So if something is a complete food source, it means it has all 10-ish of those amino of those essential amino acids that your body can't make. All right, and then finally we have sort of the simplest of our biological macromolecules, which are nucleic acids. Uh, these are composed of five elements. So we had cho, cho, chan. Now we have chan, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. 
Okay, you've heard of examples of DNA of nucleic acids before. DNA literally stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. That's a nucleic acid, double stranded, found in the nucleus. RNA, ribonucleic acid, is single stranded, found throughout the cell. And we'll get into DNA and RNA in great detail later this semester. Now, the building blocks of nucleic acids are what we call nucleotides, and we'll learn more about this when we learn about the structure of DNA, but for right now, all I want you to know is that the monomer of nucleic acids are nucleotides, and a nucleotide is a subunit that consists of a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogen base. And then when we study DNA, you'll really get to learn what that means. So like I said, examples of nucleic acid are DNA and RNA. Um, their function, obviously, is to store and transmit genetic information, which is really important in maintaining the next generation after reproduction. All right, now the last little bit, and this can be kind of confusing. You need to understand that the macromolecules are there for things that you need. So you have to be able to break them down and build them back up into the macromolecules that your body needs or that any living organism needs. So you have to be able to build macromolecules. The way you build macromolecules is by putting together those little subunits, right? That is done through a process called dehydration synthesis. You are bonding monomers to each other. Now, you have to expose bonds. In order to expose bonds so that they can bond with each other, you're basically gonna take an OH from one monomer and an H from the other. So two H's, and an O, that is a water molecule. So you are removing a water molecule in order to bond those monomers together. So there's a loss of water, okay? That's why it's called dehydration synthesis. This process does require energy. So building macromolecules does require energy. Loss of water requires energy to make that bond. The opposite of that is what you need in order to be able to turn your big food molecules that you eat into smaller, more usable parts. That's digestion. But the actual reaction that makes that happen is called hydrolysis reactions. So in this case, you have to add a water because you you're gonna expose some bonds. So an O is, or sorry, an H is gonna bond to one and an OH is gonna bond to the other now empty exposed bond to break them apart back into their individual monomers. So using water, adding water, that's why it's called hydrolysis, to split off the monomers. This process releases energy, okay? Breaking those bonds apart, creating smaller subunits, digesting your food, that is creating, releasing energy. You're getting the energy from the bonds that were formed. All right, I know that can be a lot, um, but that's all I have for you today, so I hope you are having a great day.